Hey, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. and today I'm reviewing Tesseract from Smirk and Dagger Games. Tesseract is a one to four player cooperative game in which players are trying to uh, deal with disassembling this Tesseract magical cube that has appeared over the cities, the skies, something or other. I don't, I don't know entirely what's going on here, but I do know that something strange is happening and it's your goal to try to solve this problem. The problem in this game consists of trying to gather these dice, these 64 dice that are on this platform over here, and it's worth noting there are a variety, variety of degrees of difficulty decided by the platform that you play with, but you're going to have 64 dice over here and you need to get 24 of those 64 dice onto this containment field in the exact numbers. You need a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 of blue and of every other color, and you need to be mindful of the fact that every single turn dice are falling down from the Tesseract and you need to use your abilities, the core actions you have in the game, your player abilities, whatever special player abilities you have, as well as the various cards you'll earn across the course of the game in order to outpace the cube slowly disassembling itself. To that end, the way you're going to play through the game is you're going to take two actions every single turn. You're going to go at three actions, three actions every single turn. What you're going to do is you're going to go ahead and look at the action phase over here, taking a bunch of actions. Very commonly, an action might be something like, you know, removing a cube from the tester act and putting it into your lab. Now, it's worth noting you're actually going to go ahead and have, you know, two of these cubes already in players' labs at the beginning of the game, and these other two cubes are going to go ahead and be primed, setting off the side. This is all dependent on player count. But over here, we're going to have cubes in the prime field over here. We're going to have these cubes are putting into our lab. And so on a turn, let's say we go ahead and maybe I want this three over here. This three can be helpful. So for my first action, I'll take this three. For my second action, I'll take this two. Now you can only take from an exposed die, a die that has at least three sides touching the air, as opposed to just two sides touching the air. You need to have at least three sides that you can see in the die in order to take it off the, to the cube. So I went ahead and I took two dice over here. So I now have a two, three, and four. And this is where it matters because for my third action, I'm going to go ahead and contain a die. When you contain a die, you need a sequence of numbers. You either need three of the same kind mind or three in order of sequence. So two, three, four, three, four, five, four, five, six, et cetera, like that. But you need at least three, and they need to all be the same color or all different colors. So a two, three, four of all different colors would work. So do a two, three, four of the same color. When you contain them, you're going to select one of these dice over here. So for example, I'll go ahead and select this four. I'm going to put it down over here. And these other two, I can choose to either keep them as is, or I can re-roll them. And if I re-roll them, I get whatever new values there are. But I also take a card equal to the number of dice I re-roll which gives you a choice. You can choose to go ahead and get powers and abilities, but also random dice, or you could choose to maintain the consistency of either a string of numbers or the same number in order to use them for the next time you want to contain. I went ahead and re-rolled, which means I'm going to go ahead and grab an ability card. I'm going to add that, and that's going to be another card I now have access to in the game. Then I'm going to go ahead to the threat phase. I've done three actions. I pulled two and I contained. In the threat phase, you're going to remove the lowest cube from the Tesseract. So in this case, the lowest cube, you're looking for the lowest color and then also the lowest number. So for example, this one over here is going to be the one that is the lowest down that I can remove. We're going to grab it, we're going to roll it, we're going to prime it, and it's going to go into this primed area. Now you do need to be mindful because if you ever add a third cube to the primed area, that's going to result in a breach where you're going to advance this token, and slowly that's going to get to the end where you're going to lose if you have too many breaches. So at first, the primed area, not that much of a threat, but you will need to be mindful since as dice are out of there, you have to find ways of containing them or removing them from the board. To that end, we're going to go over here to this player's action, and one thing we haven't talked about, well, we haven't talked about any of those abilities. You've only seen me do two abilities. You've seen me remove a die from the Tesseract, and you've seen me contain a sequence of dice by putting it into the center containment field. The other actions you have is you can adjust. You can adjust either a primed die over here or a die into your lab. And the most basic reason you'd want to do a prime die is prime dice get lower and lower and lower until eventually when you adjust a one, you remove it from the primed area. That's going to be one of multiple ways you can remove a die from the primed area. Priming a die or adjusting a die in your lab gives you the opportunity to make patterns and sequences you might, other, might, other, might, might otherwise not be able to do. Then we have transfer where you can give another player a die. We have study where you can discard a research card to draw one of the next highest level. And then the unique action is going to be the action that you have. In this case, this transport engineer has take two cubes of the same color from the Tesseract and place them into your lab. So let's go ahead and do that. We have a six over here. Let's go ahead and grab a five and a six over here. These are both exposed dice. We're going to spend our first action doing that. And we can track our actions over here if you want or just keep track of them. So our first action is that. Our second action is going to be turning this into a six over here. And then our third action is going to be containing. And this is important because one of the options you have at disposal is if you ever contain a die that has a matching prime die, for example, the six over here, we're going to place it. That die is contained and we have a matching six here. We're going to go ahead and 
remove that prime die from play, we're taking it out of the risk area where we're going to have more prime dice being added. So again, even though you can slowly adjust the die downwards to become a 1 and eventually be removed entirely, you can also contain a die that matches a die in the primed area in order to remove that die as well. So again, we took three actions. We're going to look at the cube. This is now the lowest one. We're going to go ahead and take this. We're going to roll it. And we're going to go ahead and put it into the primed area. So that's basically how you play through this. So again, you're going through a bunch of actions. You're going to be removing dice in the tester act. You're going to be adjusting dice in the primed area or in your personal play area. You're going to be taking actions to contain sequences of dice, which is where you want to try to make sure you have a variety of strings, a variety of same numbers, trying to be mindful, by the way, I could have gone, gone ahead and re-rolled these in order to take a card, in this case I chose not to. You're going to be using your card abilities, you have a bunch of abilities, you're going to start the game with one, and you can earn more as you contain dice. You're also going to be trying to create strings over here. Whenever you have two of the same number, so if I go ahead and I put, you know, let's grab something else, let's grab uh, this yellow die over here, let's pretend I had gone ahead and placed this here, then we're going to go ahead and reveal that matching thing. So we're going to reveal the six over here because we have two of a kind, and then once we get all four, we can go ahead and take this ability where we can utilize this ability, and these are strong, powerful abilities, there's one for each number, once you get a full six of a kind, you earn that ability. Similarly, Whenever you have a full string over here, you're going to be able to go ahead and take one removed die and add it back to the tester rack. So you're going to be able to add up to four more dice back to the tester rack. And those small little changes or adjustments, those small little things that you're fighting back against the uh, flow of time, is going to be essential to keep you alive. The last thing to note is going to be past the fact that your players, all your characters, all have an action as well as an ongoing ability that's just passively in play. Whenever you remove the final die from a column, exposing the bottom below it, you're going to go ahead and deal with whatever effect is going to be on this board over here. So in this case, we're going to fortify. So we're going to take this, we add this, we put it there. Fortify, we roll the lowest prime cube. So for example, this one, which is so close to actually leaving the board, it only requires a single adjust action, now has to be re-rolled, and fortunately it's a one again, so that worked out in our favor. Now this is the tamest, fortify is the tamest of all the actions. Very often you'll have a bunch of actions that trigger it, you go ahead and take another die, another die off the Tesseract, go ahead and prime the lowest cube in the Tesseract, and a random destroyed cube. You're going to have a bunch of abilities over here, and this is where the player boards you're playing with are going to adjust the difficulty of the game, because the more punishing the effect, those effects are slowly but surely going to be revealed, and you will have to deal with the consequences of them, and that's where the difficulty scaling of the game comes in to ensure that there's a distribution of just how punishing the game will be as it hits you every single time you expose that layer. So once again, on your turn you take three actions, you go ahead and then match that by removing a die from the Tesseract, slowly but surely you're going to remove symbols, that's going to result in more bad things happening, you need to be mindful that as you add more dice to the primed area, you want to adjust them constantly. If we have another one over here, maybe we want to go ahead, well let's pretend we had two like fours over here, if we had a four over here, you might want to go ahead and turn that down to a three, if only so that when you go ahead and roll another four, it's not going to hit that primed area again and cause another issue. So you're constantly just trying to keep everything alive while you desperately try to survive in Tesseract. Which brings us to the review starting off with how to play First of all, it's worth noting, this game does have a dice implementation. That's going to be a bit of a guided walkthrough of how to play the game. I don't love those myself. I prefer a good rulebook. So while I've tried out the dice walkthrough just to get a sense of it, and it does work, I like just running through the rulebook. And the rulebook is fairly simple to understand, fairly straightforward, for the most part, fairly clear. I will say the difficulty scaling, one note worth mentioning, is the difficulty seems like the numbers you're gonna have two you're gonna have double sided uh uh you know whatever this this these bottom platforms you're gonna have double sided platforms and they come in various difficulties up one through eight the only problem is a bit of a miscommunication in terms of how they operate really it goes one five two six one five two six three seven four eight is the order of difficulty because of the way they were printed. So if you're looking for the lowest, the the if you're looking for the second lowest difficulty, it's five, and the third lowest difficulty is two. I know it's a bit confusing. It's just the way they pair up. So one five two six three seven four eight. Because if you don't know that, you might find yourself playing things that you are playing the wrong difficulty than what you would otherwise expect. Uh, past that, a game typically runs around the hour mark. You can have a faster game in around 45 minutes if you're, you know, really trying to move forward in it. But I find there is a degree of thinkiness to the game, and it generally does run in the 45 minutes to an hour mark. As far as what I like, don't like, and can see others not liking, starting off with what I like, which is the core puzzle at play. This is a game of trying to manage your actions and efficiency as you try to create strings of numbers. So you're just trying to pull things off the Tesseract, and then trying to be mindful of the fact that you're also creating opportunities for the Tesseract to slowly get, but surely get smaller. And that's where the player abilities are going to be absolutely key in this game, because there are a whole bunch of these researcher, researcher abilities, all completely changing the way you approach this game. These, to me, are a big part of the variety of experience, as well as these action cards you're going to earn throughout the course of the game. And trying to balance when you go ahead and re-roll a sequence of 
four dice to be able to take a powerful action card versus when you keep those four dice because then you can possibly contain two or three dice in a row if you're if you're if you're diligent about how you build out those dice it's a big part of the experience Ultimately, you're trying to race the cube. There are 64 cubes in play, 54, 64 dice. You're trying to get 24 specific of those 64 dice onto this board. You need to be mindful of the order of the way this cube is constructed, the way things are slowly going to tear down, the abilities you have that will pull things back into play. You're trying to take advantage of every degree of every way you can eke out just, just a drop more out of the system because this entire game is about staying one step ahead of the slowly disintegrating Tesseract. That's where your player abilities are going to come into play. That's where uh, maximizing the way your dice combine is going to come into play. That's where utilizing these cards are going to come into play. That's when utilizing all these bonuses around the board is going to come into play. There's a bunch of things at your disposal and you have to use them all in order to stay ahead of the test rack. Even at the most basic level, the game provides a challenge and you will match that challenge across multiple plays and that's where the various, various difficulty level scaling will come into play because it does give you a lot to consider or a lot to ramp up with the more and more punishing actions that are slowly revealed as you remove dice from the test rack. So a, a lot of powers and abilities, a lot of things you can try to use to maximize and optimize and then difficulty scaling as well to match yourself or your fellow players at the table as you get better at the game. As far as what I don't like in the game, there's really two things, but they are big factors that might impact how much I enjoy Tesseract. The first is that the gameplay is somewhat repetitive, and the second is that there's no truly evolving enemy that keeps the game fresh. What I mean by that is the core actions you're taking ultimately are grabbing cubes and Tesseract, trying to line up the way they're going to create sequences, trying to earn the cards, rinse and repeat while optimizing with the various tools at your disposal for 45 minutes to an hour, you're going through that somewhat sem similar sequence again and again. And that pairs together with the second aspect, which is there's not a truly evolving enemy. If you've played other cooperative games where the game is constantly throwing bad things at you, Tesseract isn't throwing a lot of bad things at you. It's removing a lowest die from the pillar, which means it's predictable and somewhat repetitive. There's not a sense of things coming at you from different angles, having to navigate across the map, having to deal with evolving threats. This game doesn't have that. It has a puzzle, a puzzle that is punishing, a puzzle that is hard a puzzle that you have to optimize your way through. But the lack of an evolving enemy, the lack of something that is being thrown at you from different directions and constantly keeping you on your toes, means you are going through similar motions throughout that 45 minutes to an hour. I like the puzzle. I enjoy the puzzle. But it doesn't, it doesn't change. It doesn't change across that 45 to 60 minutes, which means to me, this thing could have been half the time and given me the same level of reward without the same level of longevity, without an evolving aspect to that longevity. As far as I can see, others not liking... First of all, the game can feel very punishing. Even if you're winning, it often feels like you're losing. In that sense, this game has a lot of similar in common with Spirit Island, which constantly feels like you're losing even when you're winning. This game, even at the easiest difficulty level, feels like you start getting towards the halfway point, you start to realize you're running out of cubes in the Tesseract and you haven't filled this fast enough and you need to unlock these cards and use these abilities so that you can stay ahead. The game does have a nice arc that has you relying on some of the abilities you're picking up in the second half, which means it feels like you're losing until you like, overcome that crest, overcome that hill, and start marching your way towards victory and so the game feels punishing even on as easy levels and as you actually ramp up the difficulty the game straight up is punishing as far as final thoughts on tesseract i i like tesseract but i also have concerns about longevity i really enjoy this puzzle this is a game i was very excited to play when i first when i first saw it on kickstarter it was a game i was very excited to play i got the metal dice and everything i wanted to try it out it looked exactly like my kind of puzzle reminiscent of games like pandemic like the loop like any of these cooperative experiences where it's all about figuring out the puzzle of powers and abilities at your disposal and in that sense tesseract delivered the powers and abilities here, the, the character powers, are so much fun. I've been going through all of them as I play, specifically choosing different ones so I get to experience them, and they all feel so powerful and twist the way you have an advantage over the game system, and you have to use every single advantage to survive. The game is a challenging puzzle that I do find rewarding to go through, with the big but being the thing I talked about already, which is the slightly repetitive gameplay with a lack of evolving enemy. And that puts, puts me in a place where, to me, when I was thinking of what to rate Tesseract, a 3.5 felt too low. I enjoy the game more than that. I like Tesseract a lot. I've been having a lot of fun with it. I'm continuously happy to jump in and play it. So for me, this is a four out of five. But it's also a four to five with the caveat, with the knowledge that I wonder if it'll go down over time. Right now, I'm still enjoying it. Right now, I still have a lot of fun with it. Right now, I'm still exploring the cards, the abilities, trying to ramp up the difficulty more and more to see how far I can push myself. And so right now, it is a four to five. But the way the dice do devolve, it's one that I am I am skeptical it'll hold up forever. I'm skeptical it'll have the same longevity as other games I've enjoyed this much. I enjoy it a lot, and I wonder how well that will hold up 
10 plays down the road as opposed to where I am currently. So it is a four to five with the knowledge and the caveat that I somewhat expect it to go down half a point or so, but for right now, I'm still very much enjoying it. As far as other game recommendations, I mentioned them already, but Tesseract very much feels reminiscent between the player powers, between the, the enemy trying to attack you, which in this case is just the dice slowly disappearing, between you trying to solve something, feels very reminiscent to Pandemic, a classic for a reason. Pandemic's going to be from Rob Davio from Z-Man Games, a fantastic game of having the rules slowly beset by disease, which is not great, but you ultimately are there to save it, which I guess is great. And then similarly, one of my favorite cooperative games in the genre of players do good things and game does bad things is going to be The Loop from Pandasaurus Games, a fantastic experience that constantly keeps you on your toes with a variety of missions and different things constantly being thrown your way and scenarios happening, very variable and very enjoyable to go through. So The Pandemic and The Loop are going to be my two other game recommendations. In any case, and until next time, I'm Alex Radcliffe from Board Game Co. Hope you enjoyed this video, and as always, I hope you have a good one.